Hello and welcome to the Anti-Heroes Podcast with your host, Zach Blair. I am Zach Blair. And man, today we have such a good interview. I was really nervous about this one. Oddly enough, this is Buzz Osborne from the Melvins. And I only say oddly enough because I, I, you know, I don't get nervous much anymore. But with this guy, he's just, he's such an original. He's such the sort of template of why I wanted to do this podcast. He was sort of one of the people I had in mind when I, I thought this thing up. No one plays like this guy. No one sounds like this guy. No one uses the gear that this guy uses. Just everything about him is 100% original. And so we dive all into that. We talk about his relationship with electrical guitar company guitars, uh, which are amazing. We talk about his relationship with Hilbish Design, which make his pedals uh, and his amplifiers. Uh, we talk about his cabinets. We talk about everything. We talk about his influences, uh, his favorite records. It's a deep dive in all things Buzz Osborne and all things Buzz Osborne guitar. So hopefully you are as big a fan of his as I am and you will enjoy this interview. Thank you so much again for tuning in and checking it out. And here it is, my interview with Buzz Osborne. Hey, Buzz, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I, like I said before, you know, we got started, I I wanted, you were sort of the template, the the guy I wanted when I had this whole podcast in mind and just get into all the, all the stuff. We were just talking about the Judas Priest Unleashed in the East record. You know, I heard, I don't know if you can confirm or deny if you've heard this too. They had recorded that live and I guess Halford had a bad night. So then he re-recorded all the vocals in one take uh, in a friend's house that they had turned into a makeshift studio. Have you heard that? I actually asked Rob Halford about that personally. Oh, shit. And, uh, and it, he also talks about that in his book. Oh, see, I haven't read the book yet. Yeah, he, he has a lot of good stuff in the book. <laughs> I got to read the book. Um, he, uh, um, he was partially sick the night that they recorded that. So they got a great musical recording, but they didn't get a good vocal recording. Okay. And she so goes, let me do, go in there with a microphone. I'll just pretend like I'm there and I'll run through this, the set the way I would normally. And uh, that's what he did. And the, how, the random house that they were at was at Ringo's house. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ringo's house. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That's bananas. Yeah. And so I, I personally think that that record, the Unleashed in the East record, is the best heavy metal record ever made. I agree. I think that's the best. I mean, especially the new wave of British heavy metal. I think it's it's definitely the top. They are the kings of that sort of thing in a way that bands haven't ever been able to do. It's much more musical. It's got a lot of depth. It's got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ups and downs. And, and I just think it's a fantastic record. I think it's their best record, but it's also the best heavy metal record ever made. Now, what? You think it's better? Well, yeah, sorry. You know? <laughs> sorry. It you're is wrong. If you, you know, I mean, you're wrong. You, you can you can compare it to whatever you want, yeah. but that to me is the best heavy metal record ever made. I'm gonna agree with you. Isn't it Les Binks plays drums on that record? It is Les Binks. I, I play in another band sometimes called Phantomas with Dave Lombardo. Oh, I do it. Yeah, and um, I asked Dave about that record. He goes, so he goes, everything that I know, I learned from Les Binks on that record. No shit. And if you listen to it. All that's there. All the double bass, all the all that stuff is all on that record. What happened to Les Binks after Judas Priest? I think he has. He, he plays in like a Les Binks type band, and he's been around. <laughs> I I don't know why he was kicked out. I should have asked Rob that, but or if he quit or what what he did, I'm not sure. But the record, the drummers that they got after that are much less musical. I agree. More straightforward. But that record is uh, the drums are really really good, and. Uh, um, and people go, oh, I can't stand his vocals. And it's like, well, once again, you're just you're just wrong. Yeah, you're just <laughs> wrong. I'm like, sorry. Rob is great. Um, that record is great. I will never tire of that record ever. I'm I'm. You know? It is one of those. It's perfect, and you can listen to it always, and it never yeah. gets old. It never gets old. I love how musical those guys are. Much, much, much more musical than um, people give them credit for. I agree. That's that's it's highly advanced heavy metal music. 
Yeah, it's just like yeah. anything else where there's the, the no, it doesn't matter the genre of music. You can like or dislike whatever genre, but there are the bands that are the band of that genre and you can't deny it. And like you said, you're wrong. <laughs> I think so. And the songs are good. That's a thing. That's true. The choices of covers in that, you know, uh, Diamonds and Rust and Green Man Lishi. I mean, Green Man Lishi, that's how I, that, from that record, that's how I learned about uh, Peter Green. You know, oh, man. I heard that before I ever heard the Fleetwood Mac stuff. I heard I that. I did the, too. I did too. Came out around, I don't know what it was, 78, something like that. I didn't know who Peter Green was. And then I heard Green Man Lishi and I realized oh, it was written by somebody else. Yep. And then once I got into that stuff, um, I realized that they were, uh, Highly influenced by a bunch of people that were really cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then I, it's funny, I did the same trajectory and then I got obsessed with Peter Green and I went down, a, you know, Blues Breakers and early Fleetwood Mac rabbit hole and just, I, I'm kind of still in that, to be honest with you. He's got five songs I think are uh, absolute classics. Yeah. You know, that, that I think are just, I, I describe it as, uh, you know how ZZ Top kind of took the blues and made it into good time party music? Right. I think is really good. Well, Peter Green made it into bad time music. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's you know, excellent. No happy party atmosphere to his songs. It's very, very bad mood stuff. You're right. You know, Green Man Leashy, he always said, oh, it's money. Green is green is money. And I was like, no, it's you. Yeah. You know, talking about what's happening with you, the Green Man Leashy, you know. And then knowing what eventually happened to him, you're right. There's a melancholy to everything. If you know, you know, you know what, that wasn't going to end well and didn't end well. No, he had a hard time. I saw him play eight years or 10 years before he died, and he was out of it. But he wow. played good. You know, I mean, uh, you could tell. I mean, he's got a lot of problems. And, you know, I mean, maybe today they would be able to treat him better with some kind of drugs. I'm certainly no expert along those lines. Sure. Um, he battled a lot of demons. A lot yeah. of the good guitar players in that band did, too. It's crazy. That's true. And there's a whole history of that band that no one knows about, you know, before Stevie Nicks. Oh, fully. It's like two different things. Yeah. They were just different bands. Yeah, I, I think his stuff is really good. I love the way he played. He doesn't play fast, which I think is is really cool. Uh, he's he's not unlike a lot of the guys I think are really good guitar players, like uh, you know Billy Gibbons or Eric Clapton. They don't play fast. Exactly. They're not speed weenie guitar players at all, and it's much more deliberate to me and speaks to me more. Every note weighs a thousand pounds. Yeah, you know. And for me, Peter Green was what everyone loved about Eric Clapton, in my opinion. You know, of course, no, not disparaging Eric Clapton, but I thought Peter Green was doing what everybody loved about Eric Clapton sort of better than Eric Clapton, in my, you know, in my opinion. Cream, to me, is like one of the best bands ever. That's true, too. I mean, that taking nothing away. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. I saw them on their one of their last shows at Madison Square Garden. You did? I saw it, yeah. And they were unbelievable. And when was, yeah, when was that? That would have been uh, mid two thousands. Oh, they got back together and did a thing. Yes. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. They did. And uh, I was like, I'd always said Dale had. He goes, you always said if Cream gets back together, you're going to go see him, one way or another. And uh, um, I did. And um, me and him went to it, and it was uh, an absolutely fabulous show. Everything you could possibly want them to do in a two hour set with no opening band. Wow. And it was phenomenal. You know, you don't hear a lot of people talk about that kind of stuff. And the, to me, they were, uh, they sold a lot of records, but they were a weird band. Uh, yeah, they were. You listen to like the studio record of Wheels of Fire. That is a weird record. Yeah. I never hear people talk about that stuff, ever. You're right. And uh, the, the fact that three guys would play solos at the same time and somehow it worked, you know? <laughs> Jack Bruce is amazing. I think uh, his downfall was probably alcohol, probably. Yeah. Um, ultimately killed him, I think. I think he had a liver replacement, but that kind of thing happens in rock music, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that psychedelics or whatever else drugs they were on never helped any of those guys in their musical quest for freedom, whatever. Yeah. And the argument could be made that, that they laid the groundwork for what could be the power trio, you know, quote unquote, that, you know, you guys sort of, I mean, outside of your four piece excursions with big business, but you, you know, you sort of laid the groundwork for the, the big three piece bands that were able to go, oh, fuck, we can do it with three guys, you know? Oh, we weren't afraid of it. Yeah, not, definitely not. A lot of people around where when we started at a, I could pick from, you know, I'm going to get a great singer. That was, that was, that was not possible. So I, I kind of picked that up. But weirdly, I was like singing since I was a little kid. 
eighth grade, kindergarten, when we would sing in school, I remember um, thinking that I wanted my voice to reach all the way to the corners of the top of the room. Right. You know, I felt and, like my voice was doing that even then. Yeah. So I've always loved singing. I've loved it. And I've figured in my musical world that my singing and my guitar playing were equally important. Absolutely. And what I did, you know, for me. Other than Phantom I've never been in a band where I just played guitar, you know. Well, you definitely have one of the most discernible voices in, in okay. rock music, I think. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, that's buzz. You know, you just know. You just know. Well, thank you. And that's a very difficult thing. And, you know, and also, since we are uh, talking about guitar playing, absolutely. With I think the biggest compliment you could give anybody is that they can play for five seconds and you know who they are. And you have, with your voice and with your guitar playing on both both fronts, have always been that discernible and, and uh, always been an influence on me. Um, so don't blame me. <laughs> oh, I, I'm absolutely blaming you. Uh, well, can we, what's your, what, who are your guys? Who are your influences starting out? Uh, starting out? Um, or to this day? I um, started playing guitar late. I didn't start playing guitar until I was 18. Okay. 19, maybe. I played a tiny bit of acoustic guitar in a class in high school. Um, I would say that there is not a single thing that I got from that <laughs> in my guitar, right? guitar playing, which I've always thought was really funny with guitar. Um, I've never taken guitar lessons, but I always thought it was funny when you, you look at like, uh, in some circles, Jimi Hendrix is the greatest guitar player that there ever was. Right. Yet there's not a single thing he does that any guitar teacher would ever teach anyone to do. Totally. Everything he does is wrong, right. yet he's the best. So it's like either he's wrong and he's the best or the guitar teachers are wrong. You know, which is right. it? You know, because if he's the best, shouldn't he be teaching people how to play like that? Right. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's always been, it's always been funny to me that uh, um, things like that are just kind of, people don't take it seriously. It's like, this is a man, if you clearly look at him for if half a second, is thinking outside the box with every moment that he has a guitar in his hand. Right. You know, and, and I don't think people take that seriously and they don't believe it, first off. He's not doing anything right. Nothing. It's, you know, if you look at how you hold a guitar, where to put your thumb, none of it's right. It's all wrong. But he's the best. Even down to the, he doesn't even live, especially his guitar was remotely in tune. Right. You know, that none of that makes any difference because I don't think things like that have anything to do with the magic of music. Yeah, I agree. Nothing. Just like you can't throw technology at someone and make them creative. It's not possible. You can put them in the greatest studio in the world with the greatest equipment in the world. If they're not creative or they don't have any kind of musical talent, it's not gonna make any difference. Right. None. Whereas yeah. you him, the worst guitar in the world and the worst amplifier in the world, he's still going to bury almost everybody on the face of the planet. Or like I like to say, it's the Indian, not the arrow, you know? And so guys like him, I was very impressed with when I was starting. I thought he was amazing. Uh, I still do. Uh, I loved uh, Cream. I loved uh, the Ramones. And then when I got into punk rock and realized that that was kind of the music that I wanted to go down, I was very influenced by uh, things like uh, the Stooges. Okay. And uh, a lot of bands like the Gang of Four, the, uh, the Bad Brains, uh, Talking Heads. And um, Judas Priest and stuff like that, but I, I never really wanted to play music like that. I never wanted to emulate that stuff. I wanted to do something a little different. I think if uh, you want to, I want to be a band like Judas Priest. Well, you better be really good, <laughs> really good at writing those kinds of songs, and you better be really good at doing all those kinds of things. And I just didn't think that that was what I wanted to put my energy towards. Right. Frank Zappa said, he goes, if you want to play like Randy Rhodes, practice like Randy Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I never wanted to do that. So I don't, I don't spend time practicing things I'm not gonna play. Right. I gotta learn how to do this. I gotta learn all these things. I gotta play. I, gotta play. I just don't bother with that. I don't want to play guitar solos that sound like that. I want to do something else. But yeah. kind of focus my attention on trying to find something that was what I felt comfortable with. And in hindsight, I realized that I I wish that someone had just shown me an open tuning right right away. That would have made it a lot easier. <laughs> right. And why people don't show someone like an open E tuning from the very beginning. Here, you can play guitar today. 
You don't have to sit there. You can worry about all the, because I can't tell you how few times I've used an open C chord or an open D chord or an open E. Oh, I use the E, but, you know, G chord. I, I don't use those on the guitar. Right. Ever, yeah. you know, almost never. I mean, not, and, and so I approach the guitar with a much different kind of attitude towards it. And then as time went on, a few years after that, I started using a lot of weird tunings. And my guitar playing just went way off uh, out into outer space from there, you know, because now I felt like the world is open to me and I don't really care what, you know, oh, you don't know how to do this. You don't know how to do that. Yeah, you're right. And that's by design. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you created your own universe. I mean, yeah, you were the guy that, and that's revelatory because, you know, you're right. So many people listen to Judas Priest and they go, I want to sound like that. And then their band sounds exactly like Judas Priest or Black Sabbath or whatever it may be. But not as good. But not as good. And it's never going to be as good. You, you know, created this heavy music that wasn't metal. You couldn't call them Evans metal. Couldn't. But it was heavier than metal bands that were trying to be heavy. And yeah. you created something entirely yours, and that is impossible to do sometimes. I mean, I, in my opinion, I think it's impossible to do it. People say it's all been done, and they were saying that, you know, they've been saying that for 40 years, but you guys did something else. Yeah, I, I felt like I, I could hear something that was missing in all the music I was listening to. Sure. And I wanted to do a combination of, you know, um, My War by Black Flag and uh, um, Side 2 especially mixed with um the gang of four mixed with led zeppelin you know uh, you know what man i love that you know i saw a guy one time with a shirt that said side two and i was like you know what that's a person that's challenging others that is a person that's going against the grain there's one of my my mentors bill stevenson so he he has recorded every record i've ever made since i was a, a 19 not the gua records of course yeah not the gua records but i was in a band with bill stevenson and, um, you know, Bill was a drummer on that record and he, oh, yeah. he as well as a, you know, he's, I'm sure, you know, Bill, Vaguely. you know, he's, he's also like side two, you know, side two, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like, yeah. it's like a metaphor for life really, you know, I think they were heavily influenced by this band from the South Bay down or down in there called, uh, St. Vitus. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, um, yeah, yeah. they were a little more derivative of Sabbath, but they have some songs I think like. Uh, they have a song called uh, Burial at Sea I really like. I love that song. And I think those guys were good. They were one of the few bands that I think are on a complete Sabbath trip that actually did something a little different. And I th thought were, especially the first record, I thought were really good. Yeah. I think they kind of hit on something. There's a, a lot of these other Sabbath bands that I'm not, I'm not interested in it, uh, at all. You yeah. know, most of the stoner rock stuff, if you had lined me up in front of Almost all of that stuff, I would rather listen to Judy Garland's live at Carnegie Hall <laughs> without a hint of irony. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, I mean, I completely agree with you. I don't have any interest. Oh, these guys are really good. Listen, eh, I just don't care. I just don't care. I just don't feel like it's okay for me to, to listen to hideous mediocrity. Yeah. Well, and that's what, that's what the Melvins have been an answer to, I think, you know. Trying. Well, succeeding. Oh, I'll say it's a hard, it's a hard road to hoe, I'll tell you. Yeah. Not a lot of takers when he first started. There's not a lot of people that were, yeah, this is the way to go. It took a long time. Right. I'm full circle back now. We just did a tour with Ministry, first tour after COVID. Right. Ministry is, you know, Ministry. They they have a great band and they sound when they play in the stuff from like the early '90s. They sound about like what they would have sounded like then. Sure. Did big tours then, and the tour we were on with them, um, we were like. If we did the exact same set we're doing tonight that's going over well and with these guys doing their set in 1990, the entire audience would have hated our guts. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, we didn't, we didn't uh, change. We planted our flag and the people came around us, you know, <laughs> I didn't sit there and try to go, well, I wonder what it is these people are going to like. Right. I have no idea going to like. And I don't like, generally, I don't like what they like. If I just keep soldiering along with the same attitude and try all kinds of musical things with the same attitude, then eventually it should work. But if it doesn't work, well, uh, I always liked it. And um, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, uh, trying to make people not like, I'm not perverse in that. I'm going to do something that just because of this. No, no, no. I'm operating the way I would appreciate other bands operating. That's so commendable. 
you know, I mean, I don't know. Well, we're going to be part of this. We're, we have no brother bands out there. We have bands that are influenced by us that like us and stuff like that. But as far as we don't fit into a genre. No, you don't. I don't know what it would be. No, you don't. Be, you guys are grunge. Well, you know, what, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> right. What stuff? Right. We sort of have some influence on that kind of thing, like with Soundgarden or Nirvana or something like that. But those bands were in a position and had a sound that sold millions and millions and millions of records. That's we're way too weird for that. Yeah. I think our stuff should sell millions of records, but the general public doesn't. So, but there'll be enough people. That's what we always figured. Um, there'll be enough. And, um, we just worked, me and Dale just continued working crappy jobs until we were able to make a living playing music. And since that happened, we have not, we have not looked back. It's, it's been straightforward and, spending a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that's going to make it to where we can continue doing what we're doing. A lot of that means not alienating everybody that likes you in the first place, but also um, sticking to your original roots that were, we push limits. You know? Right. <laughs> well, and we're all better off for that. You know, and, and, and I've talked about it a few times on here, you know, the Greg Ginn was doing something great. I mean, that's, that's an understatement, but, but, most of the guitar players and the bands that were on SST records were bands that were sort of like-minded in that sense that they were, no one sounded like them. So he was going to put them out because no one sounded like Zoog's rift, you know, certainly not, you know what I mean? Or, and they didn't sound like saccharine trust and they didn't sound like, you know, October faction or whatever. So it was all guys that were, man, I am playing like this and this is how I play. And this is the music we make. And thankfully somebody's putting that out. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like Sacrament Trust a great deal. Yeah, it was good stuff. I saw them open for Black Flag on the My War tour. Really? Yeah. Wow. Sacrament Trust were really wow. good. Um, they had the singer. I can't think of his name. He uh, was psychotic in a way. Really? He's gonna fuck with that guy on stage because he'll kill them. <laughs> Nobody ever fucked with the singer from the Bad Brains. No. Because he's he's especially back then he was a lunatic and but lots of people fucked with Henry Rollins. Yeah, they did. <laughs> you don't get that nowadays. There's not many of those guys around anymore. The guy that like you're scared of, you know. There's a few. I mean, there's uh, a few. There's a, I always thought Jerry A from Poison Idea was like. Oh that. yeah, definitely. You know, we played some shows with them. Uh, he was putting the fear back into punk rock, which I liked. Yeah. Uh, was it Joe Biza, the guitar player for Soccer and Trust? That's it. talk about your gear a bit and i know that gets nerdy and dorky but um i also know kevin burkett and i think electrical guitar company is absolutely amazing and fabulous you've been with them for quite a while now right yeah i've done i have a lot of guitars in there so i played them for fuck i don't know how long probably close to 10 years it's great stuff you know yeah probably 10 years well and and also beyond that i got i got one of your hillbish design um compressor pedals oh yeah and it's amazing oh thank you yeah, yeah. Compression, I think, is a seriously underrated effect for guitar playing. I agree with you. Don't use it. I don't. Know, they don't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I did it with them. I did a distortion box pessimizer. Yep. A three band EQ in it, which is never happens in a distortion box, and uh, um, the depthizer, which is a uh, um, kind of an octave divider. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was so cool. Tobish is a great guy. Um, um, and a lot of things I wanted to do with pedals that were like just in the design of the pedals. And um, I wanted them to be plugged in on the top. I wanted the light to be in the top, not under my foot. Right. You know, I hate yeah. that. Yeah. I hate it. Um, I wanted them to be big. Yeah. Not tiny. I want the knobs to be big. I don't want to have to have a magnifying glass to figure out. I want the pedals to be simple. Yeah, me too. I don't want some 20 knob nightmare, you know, that, that I just don't want it. It's just, it's, it's not for me. Studio, anything goes, but um, live, that stuff, I needed it to be tough and um, big and made out of metal, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I noticed all that because I also have that same thing. I don't like a lot of options. It's just like, do the thing I want it to do and do just do yeah. that. 
I'm going to set it once and I'm not going to, you're going to bend down at during the show and adjust it. It's not going to happen. I don't have time for that. I got too much going on. Exactly. Exactly. You got a show to run. The compressor is amazing. I think it's, uh, I've been using a compressor for a long time. I use MXR. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Compressor for a lot of years. And I told him about it. I go, we got to do a compressor and I run it full up and then I don't have it on all the time. I use it for certain things like leads are really great. Some songs that are really loud. I like it because it just pushes the guitar over the edge, so, sort of, in a way that I, don't, I describe it as like, it makes the guitar play like melted butter. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to explain it. Uh, I don't know what else. Well, uh, it just feels like you, you just pushes it that much harder, not in a distortion way, but in a way that's like, whatever you do is amplified. Yeah. With the compressor. I just don't get it. Like, why don't people use it? I've come to the conclusion that guitar players are some of the most conservative people on the face of the planet. Yeah. They don't want to do things different. They want their Marshall stack and they want their, you know, whatever it is. And they want this kind of guitar and they want that. I'm in a metal band, therefore I have to have this. And my guitar has to look like this. You know, I just, I just don't get it. Yeah. I'm not a joiner in her. Well, and that, that goes back to like your use of the Sun Beta heads. Did, did Hilbish Design start making his version of that because of you? Or was he already a fan of that as well? I don't know if he was already a fan, but um, I know he. what he did was um, he never figured he'd be able to find me. I'm, I'm not hard to find, but he just figured he'd have an easier time if he sent one of the preamps to Toshi Kasai, the guy that records us. Okay. Because he goes, oh, I just send him one. I know Buzz will try it. And that's exactly what happened. And so I had been using the rack-mountable Sun Beta Lead preamps for a long, long time, but those are all from the late 70s, you know, late 70s solder, you know, late 70s parts, and um, they would break down and I'd have to, but they don't make those anymore. So when he came up with a new version of it, I A beat them immediately. And I was like, this sounds exactly the same. No kidding. Like brand new. Wow. You know? And so it's all solid state. There's no tubes. I don't use any tubes, especially live. I haven't used tubes live in a long time, unless I'm using rental gear. Right. Know? Right. Um, then I'll use a Marshall. I mean, I can use a Marshall. Um, those are the most generic things out there. But it's not my first choice. I like things that have a little more teeth to them. Sure. Or a little weirder. But uh, um, I'm not going to ask somebody for, you know, some exotic stuff for a live thing. I, I can make it work. I can make it work. Just like the guys I'm playing with, Steven and Dale, it's like, we can use any gear. Yeah. We can make it work. My, my sound doesn't depend on one thing. Like if all my gear got burned up in a fire the night before I was supposed to play a gig, I could go buy a Marshall stack and a Les Paul and I could make the, and whatever pedals were there and make it work. Right. Sure. Right. That's not going to stop me. Oh yeah. no. What will I do now? You know, <laughs> right. Just, now I can make it work. I can figure it out. Right. Um, I can't remember what, what the original question well, was. But, but, but that's, that's a true testament to you because your gear also represents your individuality because no one plays that gear, you know, and you make it sound this way that no one's going to make it sound like that. I'm not going to make that shit sound like that. As, as When I started using electrical guitars, I was, we used to rehearse in LA at a place that band Isis also rehearsed. Sure. And I went into, I knew those guys and we would be there and I realized, oh, they're, if they were there at their room, sometimes I would go down and knock and they had these guitars. I was like, what the hell are those? You know? And so I picked it up and uh, if you've never played one, for the people who haven't, you probably have, I don't know if you have, but. I have one, yeah. The necks and the aluminum ones are super thin. Yeah. They're thin. And they're all the way to the all the way to the bottom, you know, from the top all the way to the bottom is the same thickness. Yeah. And I was like, you can't do this with wood. You can't. Yeah. It's not possible to do it because it has to be ba like a baseball bat, otherwise it would crack. You are right. You know, so aluminum, it doesn't crack. And I was like, I can play stuff on this that I can't play on, a, on not the same way on a regular guitar. And so I want one of these guitars. And so they gave me his number and I called him. And I was like, I want to play these live. Um, he goes, I'll put, you know, um, Gibson pickups in them. I'll do, um, move the switch up to where the Les Paul, where the position is. Because I, I use my Les Paul switch. Me too. All the time. Yeah. All the time. And I, I've had it turned sideways, so I don't turn it on and off. So, you know, towards the bottom of the guitar is the bridge pickup. And, and, and so I have, I have it sideways. But I use uh, that as a tone mechanism for uh, three different guitar volumes three different guitar tones at all times without touching boxes yeah. full blast with, with the one at the bridge and then the middle is a little bit quieter so it's like three quarters blast and then the other one's is totally quiet really quiet and um he said he would do it for me and so wow. i uh we were went on tour 
and cruise through there. I guess maybe it was about, I guess maybe it's been longer, maybe 14 years, 13 years, you okay. know? He came up to Atlanta from Pensacola and brought the guitar. And so at Soundcheck, and so I immediately tried it through my rig. And I knew the second I plugged it in that it was going to work. Yeah. And so uh, I didn't play it that night, but I started playing it right away after that. And I've never looked back. The funny thing is, is that uh, people will say, you know, your guitar sound changed so much. When you start using those aluminum guitars, they have so much more high end. It's like, you know, don't you think I A beat him? <laughs> right. You know? Right. I, it's like, no, you're wrong. Yeah. You're just wrong, you know? Um, they have more low end than Les Paul does. In, in some instances, I, I would guess they have more high end, but for somebody to go, your sound is more high endy now, that's just crazy. And that, a lot of that depends on wh where you see the show. Right. You see me play on a all cement stage, with, you know, and think, there's not going to be as much resonant. It's going to have more high end. There's not much I can do about it. Different venues have different, you know, ways of how stuff sounds. Um, and then I changed a few things too as time went on, but not so much for that. But uh, um, once I started using those, I realized I'm onto something with this. I'm going to continue playing these. I really like these guitars. And then when the Hillbish thing came along years later, I. Uh, uh, now he's using Hillbish amps, so I got brand new um, guitars, yeah. brand new amp. Started making pedal boxes with him, and so and then I use this. There's this guy that makes Tyrant speaker cabinets. Okay, having it. Sean Patton. Um, he lives in New York now. I started having him make me custom made speaker cabinets, and then I've moved on to Bareface, and then Sean from Tyrant is going to start making me ones that are similar to those. Great. Because those are super light and they're kind of in a totally new direction for a guitar cabinet that uh, nobody's thought of. Really? They're insanely loud. It's insane what they sound like. And the ones I use for guitar are bass cabinets. They have two 12s. They're actually bass cabinets that are ported. Right. They're unbelievable. They're I'm unbelievably have to check this great. Out. And they, you could lift both of them with one in each hand. Really? Way nothing. Yeah, they got these some kind of new speaker design. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but Sean knew what they were. And so I'm going to have him – I'm using two cabinets with two 12s in them, and those sound great. And Sean's going to build me one along those lines with two 15s. That's so, blowing – I've got to see the. I've got to check this out now. You know, for the people that said your tone has changed, I've been seeing you play since 1991, and there's you can always set your watch to your tone. It's an always a great tone. It always sounds like you. That's what I always thought. I was like, you know, Fuck them. I, have a lot of, I, I would have people say that stuff to me. I've said this before in interviews. It's funny. They'll, they'll go, well, your guitar sound is different. You know, I liked it better like, like the sound you had on Stoner Witch with the Les Paul. I was like, well, what song? <laughs> right. And they go, like, Revolve. I go, think about it. And I go, oh, Revolve. No, Revolve was a Jackson <laughs> doubled with a, 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 a Fender Mustang, and the solo was played on a Stratocaster. Right. So. You're totally wrong. <laughs> I didn't that's use great. a Les Paul on that rec on that song. That's so great. I'm talking about you know, that's uh, great. People, people are they're just they have some idea. I would always hear that you, you know your older guitar sound, blah 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 blah. And so what I did was um, there was a record called Nudith Boots that we did. Oh, I know it. I used I still have my original Les Paul that I had that I recorded my first album on. Right, I recorded the whole Nudith Boots record with that guitar. With, with the Les Paul, my original Les Paul, it's a 70, 1970, Fretless Wonder, it's called, but it has, you know, thin frets. Sure. But they had replaced. But um, used the same guitar on every single overdub on that entire record, and not one person said anything about the new guitar. You know, you're, that sounds so much better. Not a fucking word. Yeah, you so don't like, know what, yeah. Right. Yeah. You guys don't know what you're listening to. Yeah. I made sure to only use that guitar for everything on that entire record. And like, I, I rarely ever do that, but I did that. I was just like, okay, I'll go back and use, not only will I use a Les Paul, I'll use the one I recorded Glee Porch treatments with, you know, and Ozma and Bullhead. Use the right. same guitar, because I only had one guitar then, you know, and um, it didn't make any difference. Didn't well, make of any course difference. not. Sounds People... great, but as it would, I mean, Les Paul's are great guitar. Sure. But uh, uh, what, the, with them, people thinking that kind of thing, they're, they're just completely out of their minds. I put it out and didn't say anything about it, right? Then just wait. Nope, never heard a word. Just cricket. Of course not. They don't, they don't hear a word. But now I use, um, in the studio, I use all kinds of guitars, which I really like. I would rather leave the guitar set up that you have in the studio as is 
and switch guitars instead of switching amps. Yeah. I like that better, but we will switch amps. I'll use a bunch of different things, but um, I usually switch between a, a Fender, a Soldano, uh, a Marshall. It's Dale's I rarely ever use. Yeah. I use it a little bit, and then um, uh, a bunch of uh, combo amps that we have. Combo amps record so well, you know? A lot of them do, yeah, really yeah. great. Yeah. I have um, some Supro uh, reissues. That oh, I think are, those are good. I like, well, what I was getting to originally was a, I prefer new gear. I'm not a I'm not a vintage guitar guy. I think that that's crazy. I think it's it's it's. I'd rather just use brand new gear. I, I like brand new guitars, brand new amps, brand new speaker cabinets. You know, right out of the box. I like them much more than uh, going out and finding vintage guitars. It's, it's just like eh. people go, it sounds so much better. No, uh, it, 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 you might think that, but I, honestly, you couldn't tell. Right. You know like walking out on stage knowing that I am the only guitar player on earth who's using this exact setup at See, this moment. That's what's so discernible you, yeah. because I think, I think it is so in vogue as a guitar player to go, well, I like vintage gear. It's like, do you really? Cause I think you only like it because everybody else says they like it and they probably don't either. That's it. You know, Hendrix is using new guitars. Absolutely. So was the, 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 the so was the, the uh, velvet underground. They were using brand new gear. Yeah. yeah, it's true. People now and they'll go, well, it was, that was good stuff. It's like bullshit, bullshit, you know, whatever, whatever. Bullshit. That, if you look at those old seventies, those old seventies guitars, those guys were modifying their guitars back then because the shit didn't work then either. I, I played tons and tons of guitars from every era and they're not all good. Yeah. Some of them are good. Yeah. Right now. I think that, um, if you were just starting out, you can get a really decent guitar for not that much money. Yeah, it's true. They play really well. Like, I really like those Dan Electros, those new ones. Yeah. They're really good. They're all really good. They use those on records a bunch, yeah. a whole bunch. Yeah. I think the, the brand new Dan Electro, you could just buy, right? You could just buy it on Amazon. You're going to have, you're going to have a great guitar when it shows up. You have to buy a case. Yeah, right. right. You know, to your point of the Sun Beta head, I actually bought one because I loved your tone so much. So I bought one, and when it got to me, it was broken. <laughs> it didn't work. Yeah, Hillbish makes every bit as good, if not better. Good. I, I should look into that. I think he's he builds ones that have uh, amps in them as well. Oh, good. And what I'm using now, what I use in the whole ministry tour is a whole different setup. It was um, he took that Sun Beta lead and put it into a pedal. Right. And so you can use it as a pedal, you know, you can, to preamp. And so what I did for the first time ever, because I tried it out on this tour, was I jammed that right straight into a power amp, which I more, normally use my Hillbish straight into a stereo crown power amp, and then split the signal into two cabinets. So each cabinet has its own volume control, as opposed to a Marshall where you'd have to have it's one volume for both cabinets. Right. You know? um, and then um, didn't use the Hillbish head at all, just used the pedal right on the pedal board. So is is that the the red fang signature one? Yeah, same thing. But oh. it's it, it's a um, it's a it, it's the same thing. But this one wasn't a red fang one. Okay, because you know? I met those guys and that that bass player for red fang. He he re like refurbishes the sun heads. You have to because they're fifty or forty years old. <laughs> yeah, he's he had a bunch. He told me. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so I was thinking about getting that pedal. So you recommend it? Well, I I haven't used it as a pedal. I've used it as a preamp. Okay. So just that straight into a power amp wow and it was good it worked i just did 34 shows with with uh ministry and i had no trouble at all wow yeah and so i think i'm gonna switch to that i brought the hillbish head with me just in case i never had to use it so wow what i wanted to build me now is a, a 1500 watt power amp that i can put on my board <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great i missed that tour in austin texas and i was on tour and it really bummed me out i wanted to see it really bad well it was time to go back to work so you needed to do it I mean, all bands are touring. You know, Ministry, it's its kind of a, a soft... Their guitar player, Mike Skasha, that was with them forever, is an old dear friend of mine. From, well, I'm from Dallas. He's like the guy from Dallas. And right. he passed away. And uh, God, what a great player he was. But I also wanted to see COC with their new drummer. And what a great tour. Yeah, he played good. Good. That's good. Not much they could do there. You know, passed away. That, that, well, once again, it's like one of those things with... Uh, not, it's not exactly a career move. Do 
have one that got away, like a guitar of yours that you had to, you know, sell or got stolen or whatever? Yeah. There's the only guitar I really want, other than more um, or weirder electrical guitar. I have probably 14 of those electrical guitars. God now. damn. You know, probably a wide variety, including the three Travis Beans, four Travis Beans I have. Oh, those are so good. Um, the one I really want, but I don't want to pay the money for them, is uh, um, a uh, 481 Rickenbacker guitar. Oh, yeah. And it slanted frets. Oh. I had one of those, and um, I was really low on money, and I sold it to our original bass player, and with the idea that at some point down the line I was going to buy it back from him, right? I fucking sold it. He just sold it. <laughs> oh my god! So I never, never, and I now they're like two thousand bucks or more or something, you know. So would you play it live? No, no. I would just want it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There's a few guitars like that I have that I really like. I have a, a Jaguar, Fender Jaguar. I really like brand new one. Those are great. I really like that. Um, the Dan Electros I have are really great. I play those a lot. And uh, I got a, uh, recently got a, a, I did a Gibson guitar, uh, you know, Riff Masters thing. And they gave yeah. me a, the, the SD that I wanted. It's a triple pickup white. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I really, really, always really wanted one of those. And then the guitar, a buddy of mine, because I'm, you know, a huge Who fan. I should have mentioned him as well, but he's uh, um, one of my favorite guitar players. Um, he gave me the uh, uh, Gibson model, Pete Townsend model that he played at Woodstock. Yeah. You know, yep. The two P90s in it. Yep. And uh, I just adore that guitar. I've used that on so many records. You know? uh, let me say, the reason I'm a guitar player is because my dad was watching Woodstock when I was five years old, and I said I wanted to do that. It's my, he's, my, I, he's one of the people that I've never met that if I did, I would probably start, like, lose my shit. Yeah, I've never met him either. I'm terrible at that kind of thing. But he's the he, guy. He said something that I loved, which was uh, I wanted to make guitar playing look lethal. Yes. You know, right. Yeah. He wasn't precious about that stuff, you know. I'm that person that for Christmas and my birthday, everybody gets me who stuff. You know, it's that's good. I mean, I have, I don't know if you can see it, but back there, that's all who tickets on that little thing there. Anyway, yeah, I love that stuff. They're I could favorite. go on and on. Uh, that's crazy. You just said that. I would say they're my favorite. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. They played the other night and I didn't go, but um, you know, my uh, electrical guitar company, I actually had a real Travis Bean that was a little wonky that I traded to Kevin and he made, he made me one and uh, yeah, he's a great guy. It's probably better. It's better. It's much better. Yeah. The new, new Travis Beans are the best Travis Beans ever made. I think. Yeah, they are great. I've played the newer ones. They're awesome. The one I had, I just didn't like it. I just got it and I thought it was cool. And I, you know, yeah, I would be, rather have like what he has. I yeah. have, I have three of the pan body ones. Okay. And back, you know, one piece, yeah. neck and body, and then wood. I, I use those live a bunch. And then um, the last tour with ministry, I went back and just used the aluminum ones for fun. And that's what that's all I use the whole trip. You know, what I like about working with guys like Kevin or with Hillbish is, or with Sean um, Tyrant is uh, you call up and you talk to him. You know, I'm not talking to some dude and who's going to be gone in six months or whatever. I talk to the guy that's going to make it. The guy that's going to make it. If I call Gibson, they're not going to make me a custom-made guitar. Right. The way I want the guitar made with some weird-ass stuff. Right. They're not going to do it. Like like with, with Kevin, what I always had with the Les Paul setup on the guitars, my problem was always the front pickup, or the, um, yeah, the front pickup, which is the neck position, I think. Yeah. Um, it was always too hot. Right. It's too hot. I get too much feedback in the middle position. And so I was like, Kevin, I want you to make me a pickup, a low output neck position pickup. And that's what he did. And he was like, right. I was, that's gonna work way better for what I'm doing. And he's like, oh my God, this sounds so great. Everybody's gonna wanna use this. It's such a great idea, you know? And so then I, he made me some and it's worked perfectly. And I've used them ever since. And I, I was like, well, how's it going to those? He goes, I can't, nobody wants them. I go, why not? He goes, that, that just sounds too weird. They don't wanna do it. <laughs> Without even hearing them. No, no, no. Give me the normal. Right, right. I should have known. They just can't do it. They just can't. When it comes down to it, they're stuck in this rut, and they're never going to get out of it. Well, and I think that's, that's the metaphor for everything we've just been talking about, though. It's not what they're hearing. It's just what they think, you know? 
And for guys like you and me, I also like the idea of working with a smaller company because they need the help more, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. using your powers for good, not evil, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, I met, I went to, did a tour of the Gibson factory in the 90s and uh, the people there were a bunch of assholes, everybody. Yeah. And I was just like, fuck you guys. I have less balls and stuff like that, but you guys, you guys are a bunch of dicks. And I just don't want anything to do with it. And the new Gibson, they're trying to change their tune. And they were very nice to me. Yeah. You know, the Gibson today are not the Gibson in the 90s who never would have talked to me. Right. You know, like that, you know? They seem to be doing cool things now. They seem to be I doing cool things. I think so. Cool they're things. trying. Yeah. Really trying. Yeah. But uh, um, I still could not get them to do what, what Kevin's done for me at Electric Guitar. There's no oh, chance. Definitely if I not. I called up Gibson and said, I want you to wind me my own pickups. And do what am I going to pay thirty grand for a guitar? You know? <laughs> right. The time I'm down, I want you to do this. I want you to do uh -huh. that. You know, the artist cost not going to happen. Yeah, you know, right. Happen. Right. And, and like with Travis Bean, you when you bought a Travis Bean originally, you bought what they made. Right. This is the models we make. Whereas my Travis Beans are the only ones in the world that are set up like Les Pauls. Right. So I have real Travis Beans that are set up like Les Pauls. So the three rarest Travis Beans that there are. That's awesome. You know, no one, but no one wants to do that. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. No one's thinking <laughs> things. It's like, okay, whatever. Right. You know, I just, I don't know. I don't know how to get, I don't know how, I don't know how people think. None of it makes any sense to me. Usually I've had really good luck working with Hilbish, Sean at Tyrant and with uh, uh, the electrical guitar company. And I think people should do it. A lot of people have bought Kevin's guitars, but then um, I don't think that they really realize how lucky they are to be involved with someone like him because as soon as he's not doing this anymore, you are never going to find anyone that's ever going to do that for you again. You know, you're absolutely right about that. You know, and, the, and those, those electrical guitars, when the, when he's done that people are going to wake up to the fact that these are really great guitars, not unlike the way they have with the Travis beans or with the Valinos, yeah. which you can't even touch now. Or you Dan Armstrong, you know, you know, for not that much money. Now, you can't touch those things. Yeah. You know? yeah. Are they really good? No, not really. The electric guitars are actually better than those. They are. But uh, people are going to wake up just like they did with those. They're going to wake up to this fact that this guy was a genius and you could have bought one from him, uh, anything you wanted, you know. And then there's, gonna, there's all these electrical guitars that are out there that all are different. Yeah. The, you know, I have this, I, I, but this one over here has that, yeah. on and on and on. And uh, he's a special cat who's not, who's not going to, there's just not going to be another one. There's not. Yeah. So guys, you should get in while the getting's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? My, mine's a one of a kind too. It's like the Dan Armstrong clear body, the aluminum yeah. neck. I had my toggle switch put up at the top because yeah. I, I, I use it all the time as well. Yeah. I had them put those. I did with my plastic ones too. Yeah, it's great. Thing. It's great. It's great. And you know, I just don't understand why people don't think of that. They're just too, they're too conservative. I just think that's, that's really what it is. Yeah. You know, you know it's I true. never thought a guy like Andy Gill from the gang of four was not, he was not conservative when it came to his guitar playing, you know, no. like the gang of four solid gold record, I think is some of the coolest guitar. some of the most original guitar I've ever heard. Yes, ever. it is. Yes, it so is. I want to take that mentality. That's the, uh, those sentiments and put it into what we're doing. You know, we're yeah. a punk rock band to start with. And people don't know that either. You know, it's like, no, you're not. Yeah, we are. What, what else are we? Well, you're what, a, would we be, you know, you're, the four mentioned, like you're the, a punk rock band and the terms of, of what an SST band was a yeah. punk rock band. Yeah. They didn't sound like anybody else. You never no. have. No one sounds like you. No, not really. It's you know? true. And I think, you know, your whole thing of like, people not getting your gear and not liking it. It's like, well, there's no way they're going to, because no one's going to pick that gear up and sound like you. It's just not going to happen. You are an original. They should want to be original as well. They should want to take True. that stuff and do something new True. with it. And I'm going to start with this weird guitar and I'm going to take it from there. You know? And that, that answers my last question is like, what is the biggest revelation of your guitar playing life? But I think that's what it is. That's what it is for me. That, that would be, or the fact that, uh, once I became unafraid, which was a long time ago, not measuring myself against other guitar players by the same measuring stick, then I, 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 was, I was freed to right. do whatever I wanted. And I didn't worry about being a, 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 
Ingve or any of these people. I just didn't worry about it. Great. He can do what he does, but I, I, I don't particularly care. If I want to listen to guitar playing like that, I'd much rather just listen to Van Halen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. And you I know. knew, I knew that as a, as a kid, when I listened to Gluey Porch treatments and saw you in 1991 at the Cannibal Club, you guys were touring your solo records. That was with Ed Hall. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. I don't remember that. I, I had, a, I mean, yeah, I was 16. That was like 2000 shows ago. <laughs> and I remember thinking nothing is like this, that nothing. Yeah. No, nothing. nothing no, That's I was kind of felt that that way. And especially now with our band, um, the lineup we have now with Stephen McDonald from Red Cross and Dale. He's amazing. Um, Stephen brings an element into the band that's never been there, which is just like almost a like glam rock New York Dolls thing. It's great. Which um, I uh, think is absolutely perfect for us. Oh, totally. On the ministry tour, he would go out there in a complete white outfit with a white um, Thunderbird bass. That's you know? great. And on the ministry tour, it was nothing but black. <laughs> right. <laughs> Steven, you just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, do it, buddy. And he is an absolute masterful bass player. Yes, he is. Yes, Far yes. better than people give him credit for. Yeah. Uh, people, that, people in the know, people that aren't stupid should realize that I am the luckiest man alive because I'm playing with this rhythm section that cannot be beat. It's true. You know? I don't it's know who, I, who am I going to replace these guys with that are going to do me better. I feel like Pete Townsend in that I can write songs for Keith Moon and the way he wrote songs for Keith Moon and the Entwistle. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, that helped him immensely because he was able to write these songs and then those guys translated it in the way that they were going to do it in a way that he couldn't have. Yeah. And made him that much better. And I feel that way too. That's you know? amazing. I what? love it. And it's like, I've, we've, there, I think it's the, the, the best we've ever been as far as that's concerned. We've done a ton of great records. We did this last year, we did a, a four album, two and a half hour acoustic record. Oh, with wow. That's those right. Guys, yeah. Um, that uh, I could never have done without ha having those two guys like that. You know? yeah. And uh, that's another thing. No, you know, it's another, we took, those Melvin songs and did them acoustically. And it was like withdrawn, you know, him playing with st um, brushes and it still works. It does work. The songs work. Yeah. It doesn't matter how you write. A lot of those songs I wrote on a, a guitar that's not even plugged in. Right. <laughs> Might be playing electric guitar, but I'm not blasting through an amp. It's right. like, that's a great riff. And it, it works acoustically. It will work. It, it translates perfectly yeah. across because that stuff works. And because I have guys that are capable of doing it. Didn't Dale play on that last Red Cross record as well? Yes, he's in Red Cross. It's, yeah, that that record's amazing as well. Yes, I mean I, I I've never understood, never understood why uh, actually both those guys, especially in, in, but Dale for years, why that some huge band hasn't picked those guys up. Yeah, that makes no sense. Yeah, it's like they're I can't think of anybody. I, I don't know who would be better. Well, <laughs> I'm like, just I'm just thankfully still in the Melvins. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I feel blessed. But yeah, yeah. if I was a huge band and I was looking for a bass player, I was looking for a drummer, those guys would be the top on my list. They are the tops. They you are know, the that should be playing with, you know, but I, I'm fortunately able to make that work. So, yeah, but I'm sure they say the same thing. They get to play with with Buzz Osborne, you know, and yeah, they're I think they're in a different class as far as them. They, they would be able to translate their work into almost any other band sure you know? sure sure you know, but i don't know that i would be able to but they can certainly do it yeah but after playing with you and playing your music and being inside your musical mind i mean that that's gonna that's gonna change some people and go man you're you're not doing things the way he does <laughs> you know? no 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 not at all and dale always says that too he's like your one is different from where a one is yeah, of course <laughs> and and that's and that's exactly why i wanted to talk to you i think that's the best way to put it your one is is different than everyone else. <laughs> yeah, that's not the one, but it's your one. And it's it your one, which He's is really good which, at interpreting it. You know, which says everything though. That that it's it's the way your hands play a guitar. It's the it's you can put you blindfold yourself and go. That's Buzz Osborne playing guitar. It's 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 what makes a great guitar player. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah, absolutely. It. And thank you for talking to me. We well, I don't want to keep it too long. This has been an hour. So goddamn, Buzz, thank you so so much. I, I don't want to fan out too much. Uh, but, no, no, but, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this podcast. What do you guys got? Are you guys touring again soon or what's going on? Yeah, we go, we go on the road headlining um, 
a lot of the places we didn't play on the ministry tour in June. And then we're going to announce another tour um, sometime soon. Okay, well, everybody stay tuned for that. Thank you again, Buzz, so much. Thank you. See, I think I did all right. I mean, you know, the whole time, I'm just thinking in my head, wow, I hope I am not coming off like the ridiculous fanboy that I am and setting off his sort of you know, censors, his spidey sense, and punishing him too much. You know, I met him when I was a kid, when I was like 16 years old, and we talked about it before I was rolling. It was like 16, I, and in and, and, and Austin, Texas, in 1991, which tells you how old I am, at a place called the Cannibal Club, which doesn't exist anymore. And I asked him what label they were on, like a fucking idiot, because, you know, you're a kid, and you don't know the proper thing to ask this person. and. He said Boner Records, and I was like, okay, I deserve that, you know. Um, he's fucking with me. That Ask a stupid question. And turns out they were on Boner Records. You know, the, the Gluey Porch Treatment album uh, is on Boner Records, and that's a great album. Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. I know I did. I hope you learned something. I'd like to thank you again so much for listening to the Antiheroes podcast. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, the people, the fine folks over at MXR and Jim Dunlop for, you know, taking a chance, for, for helping us out. They are some of the greatest, finest guitar products uh, out there. If you're a musician and you don't currently have something from them, man, you got to go out and get it for yourself because it will be in a great addition to anything you're doing, to your pedal board, to your cables, to your picks. Uh, they have the Tortex picks. I mean, you, you know, you know what they are. Okay, so I would be remiss to not leave you with some amazing Buzz Osborne music, an example of his amazing guitar playing. And, you know, the guy's the, the full package. He's a great lead guitar player. But, you know, I'm so taken with his rhythm work and what he's just done for all of us. Let's say that. You know, I picked the song Queen off the record Stoner Witch. He does the cool flatted fives, um, the devil's interval, you know, that it's come to be known as. So uh, there's going to be some of those in this intro riff, but this intro, is, this riff is just, it's amazing, and it's it's a thousand percent Buzz, Buzz Osborne. But, you know, pick up any Melvin's record, listen to any intro, listen to any any example of Buzz Osborne's guitar playing. Do yourself a favor, get into it. So here we are. Here it is with uh, Queen, uh, the song off of the amazing uh, Melvin's record, Stoner Witch. <laughs> 